everyone. This is Sophia Smallstore. I have a new podcast today. We're in the month of October, the 22nd, um, approaching our election day. I don't even want to talk about that. But uh, I have a friend here, a new friend, Randy Moggins. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing his name properly. I listened to some interviews he did recently, and I was really impressed. Not only is he extremely intelligent, but he has a grasp on this AI direction that society is going in that I don't think very many people have. And he's able to talk about it and bring angles to it, almost like social research angles that have really amazed me. So I wanted to introduce him to my listeners and see if we could create a discussion today that would be um, just sort of off the charts interesting. So welcome, Randy. How are you? Hi, Sophia. Thanks for the introduction. I hope I can live up to that. that that's a pretty tall order. But um, yeah, I'm great. I'm doing good. You just be yourself, because you will live up to I don't it. have much choice about that. It just seems to bleed out all over the place, so I probably will do that. Now, that's a place we could start, Randy, this idea of how our real selves are vanishing, because we're so controlled um, by the what I call the 2D world. And, you know, something just struck me. Um, it was probably last night, and I think I uttered it for the first time to a friend I was talking to on the phone. And I said, our job seems to be to save the 3D world reality with stuff happening in it in real time from the 2D world. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, it's kind of a form of reductionism where um, we are being reduced. Well, it's interesting that you would bring that up in the context of AI. You know, I, I know you listened to at least one interview that I did with another talk show host named Terry Joyce, where we talked about uh, Pokemon and the AI effect that was going on with that. That was all the rage this summer. And what I have seen from the years that I've spent walking this planet and um, doing the things that I've done, which includes a uh, pretty good background in technology as well. Um, I'm not as deeply into it now as I once was, but I've done programming. I've done uh, graphical user interface design work, website design, database programming. And I've basically been around the technology since um, the technology has been. Um, what happens in digital is that everything is reduced to ones and zeros. It effectively is a flat space, although most people don't really understand that. They don't understand. We are reducing information into data streams that then are pushed out through these boxes we call computers and phones and devices. And what is happening is that we are flattening the three-dimensional reality. It's actually a four-dimensional reality reality. It has as its component a fourth dimension, which is a time domain. We call it time, the chronos, but the time domain itself is kind of this, this clock processor, much like is inside of a computer that synchronizes things within the matrix reality that we live in. So we're being reduced into ones and zeros. As human living souls, we are trinary. We are body, soul, and spirit. And the AI seeks to squelch all of that down into digits that basically stream us out into a two-dimensional flat space. Randy, I knew the ones and zeros arrangement to be called binary <clears throat> code. Is that right? That's correct, yeah. So, so they're taking us from trinary, as you call it, and uh, reducing us to binary. Yeah, that's the net effect of it, uh, pun intended there. Well, what they're doing is <sighs> computers themselves are machines. They're useful for processes. You know, the way they were originally implemented, you know, back in the late 70s and early 1980s when we began to get these machines was that these were devices for computational purposes, writing, um, scientific endeavors, 
what morphed was the fact that we then came into a place where they became media devices, media generation devices. And actually, what they've become now are um, world generators because the video gaming industry, which began to rise very rapidly, especially in the 1980s, has been very clever about building these virtual worlds that we live in. And so our imaginations are also being flat spaced into digital binary devices. It's very compelling technology because when you plug into a screen, you are basically seeing things in <clears throat> very pixelated forms that have increasingly gotten more sophisticated because now we have plasma, plasma screens. And plasma is a very interesting subject as well, but it's another topic. But we are now immersive in this virtual reality world. And most people don't understand this is not just gamers anymore. I'm real familiar with the gaming culture and what that is. People who have played um, Dungeons and Dragons, for instance, maybe you grew up in the era when that was popular. Um, you've gone into World of Warcraft and the online um, <clears throat> multi-dimensional uh, multi-user games that have been put out. Know that you go into an immersive realm when you do that. Your imagination begins to interact with something that is non-human in the sense that it's representing a virtual space where you then can invest your energy, your imagination, and, and even your creativity to a certain degree. So computers very quickly scaled into something more than just working machines that served the ability of doing high-level computations as they became in themselves generators of a new reality. So, Randy, let me ask you this. Um, when I use my computer to <coughs> write a newsletter or um, type an email or read a website, download a website and read the material on it, I'm using the computer as a tool. I'm not really interacting with it. Is it. Would you describe that as me interfacing in such a way it, with a false reality or is it in a way that changes my reality? Or are there different ways to interact with these computers? No, when you're using it that way, as a word processor, as a computational device, um, doing spreadsheets, database analysis. Those are all, those are all just more elegant expressions of mathematical tools that we've had for a long time. I mean, the spreadsheet is an extension of the calculator, an extension of the slide rule, an extension of the abacus. The word presser, processor is an extension of the typewriters that we use for nearly a hundred years. To, to write and, and, and edit um, text. So in a sense, you are the master of that domain because you are using it to create, to express, to compute, to pull out of yourself ideas, thoughts, expressions, mathematical formula, whatever you're doing. You are doing the input and the machine is simply determining the output based on the functions of the software and the machine itself. Okay, so when I read a website or watch a YouTube video, what's that? Well, basically, you're consuming information at that point. Um, somebody has generated content using machines and put it onto a space we call the World Wide Web, the 666 system. <laughs> you can't escape that. And then... And then you are consuming it in, in a certain format that's being represented to you via the web browser. And why? And so why wait, wait. Why is it the six 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 system? Oh, that that goes into this whole thing, and you can anybody can go look this up. Um, the, the World Wide Web www that breaks down to what's called the six 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 or the the beast system. Um, there's this whole meme out there about the beast computer system, which is the AI intelligence. And that's, that's kind of a, a <clears throat> that's another dog leg. I don't think I want to get down because that's simple research that anybody can do. But the machine, so, so to get back to your question, on a simple level, you're interacting with information. 
I mean, this is essentially information technology. People who work in some of the fields that I've been in are called information technologists because on a pure level, what we're doing is we are we are presenting, formulating, aggregating, and representing information through a machine. Thus, input and output is all human. So I'm just breaking it down into <clears throat> stages. You were about to say, then we move. So I think you were about to go where I was going to ask you to go. So anyway, so that's okay. In, I mean, I know this isn't good or bad, but... I'm interested in where the break comes and we are actually responding to uh, cues and stimuli generated by the computer, the machine, its algorithms, I think that's the word. So why don't you continue then? Yeah, what I was going to say and what you were anticipating was that uh, there's a there's a point and, and, you know, it's real difficult to determine where it is. Where we begin to interact with machine intelligence itself, where it's no longer determined by pure, what's, what's called in programming, the principles of programming basically are garbage in, garbage out, or first in, first out, last in, first out, depending on how algorithms are being formulated. When you write a database program, you write a program with algorithms that are taking input from the human operator, and then they're representing that mathematically based on criteria. What happens when we begin to interact with the machines themselves, or more correctly, the intelligence of the machines as opposed to the intelligence of humans expressed by the machines, is that we begin to go into a binary space. We go into a place where the algorithms themselves are taking what was at one time human input and now creating from that new forms that are not part of the original algorithm and not part of the original intentionality of the human operator. But isn't that what they're designed to do? Aren't, aren't we giving them the space, the room to take our input and then create a more sophisticated form of output than we could create because they work and compute faster than we do. They work and compute faster than we do, but they do not work and compute at higher levels than we do. And this is actually the tripwire that we've entered. The reliance on machines, the reliance on technology has in itself a reductionist effect on human consciousness as we interact more and more with the machines. Go to a restaurant, a supermarket, or anywhere where people are behind a counter and uh, registering your sales. Almost never anymore will you see a human operator behind that counter that is or even could calculate your purchase in any other manner than what that machine is representing to them. And I know I do this all the time. I've, I, I mentally will add up and do the percentages on, on my tax and everything for a bill. And a lot of times I know what I'm going to pay before that, that number comes up on the LED display or on the computer display. Yet I have repeatedly gone back to errors made by, by people working in a retail establishment and pointed out their errors and, and they draw a blank face because they're not capable of looking at a column of numbers and making meaning from it anymore. It is meaningless to them. The same is true in language. The same is true in, in the representation of symbols on a lot of different levels. The machines themselves are taking what was inputted into them, but they are now abstracting them in ways that the human consciousness no longer processes at higher orders of, of intelligence. So the machines are doing something that theoretically we don't do in real time as fast or as sophisticated, but in fact they're only doing things that we can do given enough process of time, intelligence, and, and the learning necessary to be able to do those processes. So tell me where that um, fine line or or a nebulous line 
is found where we cross into the domain of interacting with the machine. And again, that's that's really hard to say, but I, I, I'll I'll point you towards again the gaming industry because what they've done is created immersive environments. Environments that aren't real in the sense of the world itself, um, where they begin to interplay with human imagination on the subconscious level and on the symbolic level, where we begin to see people moving into a machine reality that's more real to them than the world around them. Uh, I would say that the mobile devices, the phones, are probably the most insidious devices in this regard because they now are everywhere. They are in the hands of nearly every person walking every street in America and around the world. They're ubiquitous devices, and they're devices that are creating an ordered reality. We're, we're interacting with these devices on a personal level. It is something that you put in your hand. It has a kinesthetic aspect to it and you're interacting with it in a personal way that's not possible when you sit down at a computer keyboard and a screen although the computer keyboard and the screen are also mechanisms for the same thing but where we begin to go off is when we become immersive when we are connected electrically to these systems and the technology behind mobile phones especially because of the spectrum they occupy, because of the fact that, that we live in a world now that is saturated with electromagnetic frequencies as a result of microwave towers, not to mention all the other spectrums that are out there bleeding into us. They are altering us like drugs. This is a drug. Actually, I was running off to unplug my telephone because I was thinking about what you said. And I was thinking about, you know, the old telephones that all you did was you had a keypad or a dial thing and a you dial. dialed a number. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. And so that was a machine, but it was so, uh, so Stone Age compared to the phones now. And that was a machine that you... Uh, interacted through to someone else. The sole purpose of it was to reach another person in real time and get a conversation going with that person. So these new phones, uh, you said something when on that uh, interview that I listened to, the one that you mentioned at the beginning of the show, that the iPhone or the mobile phone was what brought women into the world of technology, interacting, technology. technology. Yeah. Can you tell us about that a little bit? Because that was a fantastic observation. Yeah, it's actually kind of depressing in a way. Um, you know, technology, and I'm not being sexist here, I can tell you the technology has largely been a male-dominated field. There's exceptions to that, and there always have been. There's brilliant women that have contributed tremendously to computer science over the years. Um, but technology has largely been a male-dominated field. If you look at the um, people who were at the forefront, theoretically, the so-called pioneers of technology, again, many of these people are figureheads. Um, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, um, the founders of the original seminal technology companies in Silicon Valley going back into the 1970s. It was a largely male-dominated field, and technology itself has been male-dominated. Um, the devices themselves, the computers, you know, in a, in a funny kind of way, I, I used to do computer training back in the 90s. I, I, I was a certified Microsoft trainer, largely working with spreadsheets and databases, the females actually understood the computer because many of them came from what we would call the secretarial pool, the clerical workers, the people who use typewriters and calculators. Male executives were the dumbest people in the world in terms of, of the computer technology as it was emerging into the, the business systems. But the technology field itself and the usage of devices at a high level was still largely male. I mean, women have, it's kind of like guys with cars. You know, women like nice cars. They like vehicles. They drive cars. 
men are obsessive about cars. You know, not all of them, but many of them. Males tend to look at what size engine you got, how much how much displacement you're getting off of your engine, the horsepower, you know, all the specifications, all the minutiae that goes into the machines themselves. That's men because we tend to be very left-brained, very kinesthetic, and, and very mechanical in a lot of our functions, whereas women tend to represent right brain, empathic, um, sort of the more abstract side of things. But the mobile phones, beginning with the iPhone, were marketed in a certain way that they attracted females into technology in a way I never saw it. You know, from the time of the introduction of the iPhone, you know, there was this sexiness to it, this idea that you could pull this thing out of your pocket. It was thin. It felt good in the hand. It was very colorful. When you used it, you were no longer punching a keypad. You were no longer using a mouse. You weren't worried about your your Ethernet cable. You, you picked it up. You used it. It was very female-friendly in the way that it responded. And because it was a because it's a touch device, it made it on one level very attractive, I think, to females in a way that, you know, is kind of difficult to understand except to say that that they no longer they no longer needed to be nerd nerd girls in order to use these devices. They no longer needed to worry about code running in the background. So women began to use these phones, you know, and I, I, I draw the iPhone because I've used I've used cellular phones myself since mm, probably the mid 1990s because largely because I was in certain businesses where I needed to have that kind of communication capability back when they were quite large, quite heavy, quite bulky. You know, you couldn't stick these phones in your pocket. So the iPhone and what came after it, the Androids and various other types of um, form factors that came off of the of the iPhone really became the technology that pulled females into it, and specifically young females. You know, one of the things that I noticed in my day-to-day -day life was how many young females, largely from like mid-teens up into their 30s, were literally walking around with their phones in their hand, much like you would have seen a woman carry a clutch purse in another, another era. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I see that all the time. Men usually put it in their pockets, but women right. carry right. it in their hand. And Randy, when you had said that in the other show, the thought that I had was that women like to stay connected, particularly to their children. Mm -hmm. And so the iPhone mm -hmm. enabled, like, you know how the programs that they have, every member of the family has a phone, it's all on the same plan. Right. Yeah. And so women could keep track of their kids very easily. You know, they would call them and the kids would call them and tell them where they were and whose house they were going to. And so that made women feel um, uh, very secure. And they. this is what I was thinking of when you said that it drew the women into the technology market. But you've explained even more than that. Right. And, and, and I hope that makes sense. I'm not, because again, it's an observation. This is more my sociologist side than anything that has to do with technology or, you know, some of the more exotic aspects to this whole thing. It's, it's just simply a, a kind of sociological observation that you make when you're out in the world all the time. I was actually... I actually commented on it a lot because I just began to notice that especially females and seem to be interacting with these devices on such a personal level. And you think about these devices for a minute. These are no longer just devices like a phone that you pick up, like our old school analog phone with the, um, the dial. I love those dialers or the push buttons that we got in the 1970s. These are devices that are shooting signals back and forth interactively. They're constantly on. They're constantly sending and receiving data. Um, the comfort of knowing where your children are comes from the fact that, that the phones are always on. You know, you can turn them off. They're, they're still functioning on a low level. But the phones effectively themselves are like these, these connections that we now make that are very quick, that enable us to be in 
complete, almost total contact with the entire world via this grid that they're building around us. I see the phones almost like a valet or a servant or an assistant. And they're there at your bidding. They will cough up whatever it is you don't know or don't or need to know. You know, all you can need to do is Google something mm -hmm. on your phone and you have the answer right there. And they will connect you with whoever you want to be connected to and you'll know that person's availability status. So they're like a, they're like having your personal assistant um, in your hand all the time. Yes, and we use them that way now. I mean, I do it too. You know, how easy is it when you have a mobile device um, and somebody asks you a question, you go, I don't know, let me look this up. And you now you don't even have to type it in. Um, all of the modern phones are voice activated. They are human voice, um, interactive, natural language interpreters so that you basically can go to Siri and ask Siri, um, this question or that question, and you will get an answer. So we're now interacting with a machine intelligence on, on a low-level AI. I mean, it requires a certain amount of artificial intelligence for a voice in a computer to go out and do a search based on the commands you've given it in natural language and come back with correct data. But that's what all of these devices are doing, all of them, Google, Microsoft now is built into Windows 10. Um, the Androids are f totally voice enabled with commands and the ability to do uh, natural language instruction sets. And of course, the iPhone, which, you know, really began all of this uh, about 10 years ago. So we're interacting now with a machine much as we would interact with a human. You know, you pick up your iPhone and you go, Siri. Tell me this. And I watch people do this. And, and I've watched people, I have watched people interact with phones. And, and the phone itself is interacting with inflection, with a certain level of human quality to the voices themselves, where now um, we have devices that are actually capable of detecting your emotional state based on your voice patterns. So we, we're no longer interacting at input-output levels. We're now interacting with these machines on a natural voice, human emotional scale that we've never seen in machines up to this point in time. Isn't that called strong AI? It, it, yeah, you know, where all of this where all this breaks down, it would be leading towards strong AI. Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, the arguments about what constitutes both weak and strong AI, they tend to scale out more on the scientific level as to what that encompasses. Certainly at the point where the machine is able to begin interpreting who you are based on emotional responses, physiological responses. Remember, these <clears throat> the Apple Watch is designed to constantly monitor your entire body. It's monitoring blood pressure, respiration, cardio function. In other words, the devices themselves are now reading who we are on a physio physiological level. And with natural language input, they're now aggregating data that enables them to determine even your emotional state. So we now have machines that are able to read us on two dimensions, our, our physical and our psychological components and interact with us in what would be considered to be appropriate manner. Okay, so Randy, you said a couple of minutes ago that we ask questions of Siri or our phone and we are given the correct answer. And immediately my um, you know, ears uh, perked up and I thought the correct answer. Hmm. What if they don't give us the correct answer? What if they give us the wrong answer? So I won't stop there. I'll just continue. And now you're talking about the way that these phones or these um, technologies can read us. They can monitor heartbeats because a smartphone is on your wrist and it has access to um, the uh, very micro rhythms of your skin and so forth. Uh, but 
they are doing effectively what we do. Because when I get in the presence of somebody, I'm also reading that person as that person is reading me. These very mm -hmm. subliminal cues that we are, we do instinctively and naturally. And some of us do it better than others. We are more perceptive, it's called, but we can do it. So now the phone is doing it to us. And I'll just uh, pause there, but I have a question to ask in a bit. So go ahead. I forget kind of where we left off. I, I, I think to answer your question, we are heading towards strong AI uh, as, as it has been envisioned by the, uh, the technocrats. And I, it, is, it is going exponential at this point. Each generation of technology is becoming stronger and stronger because of um, the underlying both software and hardware that, that, that encompass these devices. You know, right now, we're kind of at a plateau in terms of hardware, but the software itself, this is funny, um, I, we, when we went to connect today on Skype, you know, I, I have a MacBook here that I use for a lot of things I do uh, because it's, you know, it's, it's a very handy computer to have. But it now will not let me use Skype, which is what we're conducting the interview on. It won't let me use Skype now until I update Skype. Something that uh, I've noticed has happening more and more, specifically on the Macs. I don't know why that is, but... So I was locked out of using Skype on, on my computer, so I, I'm, I have to use Skype now on, on my mobile device to do the interview because my Mac locked me out. Similarly, yesterday, my Windows computer that I use to do video production and, and you know, the heavy lifting stuff that I do, um, proceeded to surreptitiously reboot itself and install a major, huge update to Windows 10 onto that computer which I, I, it started about a half an hour before I left to go to work in the morning, and it was still rebooting and installing updates when I walked out the door. I just walked out and left the thing go. The machines themselves are now updating themselves. They're now, um, a lot of them are doing it in the background. Um, the phones themselves are actually doing on-the-fly firmware updates. A lot of these so-called connected devices are doing the same thing. You're no longer interacting with the device on the level that it's going, do you want to do this update? It does the update in the background and you never realize it was done. So in effect, the software is updating and rewriting itself nearly continuously now. Well, what I had been um, leading toward was this idea that we think the machine or the technology is giving us the correct answer when what it yeah. is really doing is it's giving us an answer and we don't know that it's correct or not correct. It's the answer that all the um, computation that has been plugged into it is written to generate. And um, the other place I was going was in reading us as these machines read us. And this is what I call, or I've, been told is the strong AI, the AI that operates naturally, um, like human nature. So as it reads us and it feeds back to us, when it really gets interactive, um, which hasn't been my experience because I don't do any of this, Randy, just so you know, but I am learning about it being a reality in other people's lives. But isn't it possible for the, the phone or the gadget to interact with us in such a way that it... <laughs> I'm going to use an old, uh, old-fashioned expression. It rubs us the wrong way, and as certain people do, you know, there are people we would prefer not to spend time with because they're irritating. On very kind of, it's not overt, but there's something about them that it just isn't fun to be with them. They're constantly needling you or provoking you in some way, and it, it's too difficult to manage without losing your cool. And so I'm imagining that in the future. These machines are going to be able to push us in terms of our personality in one way or another, right? They actually already are. And the way they're doing it is they're using the vector of human emotions. And, and, and it's interesting you would bring this up. I just came back from um, 10 days where I shut down my Facebook account and um, 
It, this is actually very instructive. Um, I use Facebook in a certain way. I use Facebook to basically push out content. I promote my shows there. I post ideas there. I do interact with people there. What I began to notice beginning in early October was I was feeling anger and hostility, and I began to notice almost like a hive effect, other people manifesting the same behavior pattern to the point where it became combative. It eventually became a war zone. It went into stalking, harassment, um, pretty much almost to the point of defamation, and, and, and very much to the point where it bled into my consciousness, where interacting with the device, i.e. interacting with the interface of Facebook and interacting with people through Facebook had created a hostility, uh, an animosity on a human level that theoretically wouldn't have existed in a world where we sat and talked with each other, looked each other in the eyes, had real voice contact. Uh, it very much began to go into my consciousness. It was actually bleeding into my dream state. That's how serious it got. And that's the point where I said, I need to disconnect from this, seriously. I closed the Facebook account, which you know uh, it simply means that you shut it down. You're no longer active. You're no longer visible. All that data is still there. But I pulled away from Facebook heavily. I pulled away from interacting on any type of social media. And in fact, you know, I shut down as many things on my devices as I could that were pushing content. And that's really important to note that these devices now are not reliant on you requesting information from them. They are now pushing content, i.e. data, to you. Whether you've asked for it or not, you have asked for it. You subscribe to something, you've set up some service that's that's pushing content. But this was actually one of the goals of, of, of strong AI back when the early mobile phones were being envisioned. By that, I mean the iPhone and other content producing devices um, was push content. That was a, a relatively still unknown experience to most people, the idea of pushing content. Most of the time we are consuming content or we are interacting with content on a static level. This became very interactive. So on on that level, you now have data that's aggregating and pushing back into your stream so that you are no longer just a requester. You are actually having this data pushed at you at an energetic level to your devices. Well, that, um, that little chapter you just gave us on Facebook and you withdrawing from it, was that something that just happened on Facebook or did it happen with regard to you and Facebook or was it a culmination of your experience on Facebook? Just tell me one of those three if it pertains. <laughs> What it was, it was a culmination of interacting with Facebook, but it was more – my Facebook experience will not be the same as somebody else's. Facebook uses constant um, heuristics, which are um, very advanced algorithms running in the background to present content to people based on very sophisticated uh, – Algorithms. In other words, they're looking at who you interact with. They're looking at the level you interact with people. They're looking at groups. They're looking at the consumer aspects in terms of you as a consumer, you as a requester of data, you as a receiver of data. They're taking all of that and they're formulating an experience and an environment. <clears throat> so that environment is very nuanced relative to the individual person. So I'm interacting with specific individuals. I'm interacting with certain groups. And what I began to notice was that there was a climate building. It was a climate that was actually becoming emotionally violent and toxic. So was it me interacting with 
the people through the interface of Facebook that created that on one level, yes, it was. And that was one of the things that I said when I signed off. We have to take responsibility for interactions with people. What has really happened is, again, we flat space this. Human beings, living souls, spirits that are interacting with each other through these interfaces such as Twitter, Facebook, um, bulletin boards and things like that have now reduced humans into avatars and into abstractions of humans rather than the actual humans that those, those abstractions represent. When we do that, we are dehumanizing both ourselves and the other people and these very aggressive, what we used to call back in like the 90s when I was on these Usenet groups, they would have what were called flame wars and they were emotional wars between people in mostly groups that were driven by ideologies or ideas. And you'd have flame wars where people would just become, quite frankly, insane. And that's what I began to see interacting with people on, say, for instance, Facebook. Less Twitter, because I don't really use Twitter that much. Um, there was a hostility that was there. It was an emotional response that really wasn't appropriate. And I say that from my end. I felt anger on an appro inappropriate level. I expressed anger on an inappropriate level. And there was a group dynamic that I think is actually part of AI that then takes the energy of these aggressions and compounds them through the energy fields that are coursing through the data streams in a way that it becomes spectacularly violent on a, on a psychological level. So it's, it really is, we're not interacting with people anymore. We are interacting with avatars. And those avatars are not human to us. And we forget that. We forget that there's a living being on the other side of that communication who is capable of being wounded, offended, hurt, <laughs> emotionally depleted by the experience that, that they're having in that, in that um, user interface. Very interesting. I thought it was nice that you gave that little hurtful cough when you said hurt. Did you notice that? You said hurt, yeah. and then you yeah. gave a little cough of hurt. So, yeah, it's true. Where The gate or gateways through which we're interacting with these people are um, making them more like text and responses than real people. And I find, honestly, that this is not very gratifying. Uh, there's no animation in it. There's no um, there's no vitality in it. So this is why I really don't do it. I've kind of uh, spurned all of it. I don't know if one day I'll be forced into having to do this kind of thing more, but maybe I'll be a hermit in the uh, 2D world. Maybe there will be, be such a phenomenon where we actually become the equivalent of the hermits of old, you know, those bearded guys who lived in the forest in their cabin and never came out and all the little children from the village knew that they were there and would go over and peek at the guy and, and talk about him and um, maybe people will do that to us. They will regard us as um, very sort of uh, pariahs. Or you'll simply be in a self-imposed exile from the uh, the, the tech, technocratic ideal. You know, none of this is accident, accidental, Sophia. Um, this was all designed a long time ago. And, you know, if we could peel back the layers of history far back enough, I suspect that the technology we're interacting with now existed a long time ago as well. I mean, that's, that's, that's a speculation, but it's kind of based on what I read between the lines and looking at old manuscripts that we've been here before. And the technology is a, is, is a medium between us. It, it begins to take over the consciousness and the emotions in a way that is it natural to our rhythms? The rapidity of information when you express things on a human scale 
in in a binary stream that's coming at you at increasing and alarmingly faster rates now because bandwidth is constantly being upgraded as well. I said this years ago, and, and I've used the example over the years. If you looked at the, the evolution of computers and you go back to um, the original IBM 8088 um, processors, then the 286, 386, 486, up to the Pentium processor, our clock speeds in those computers were moving on a rather linear progression, uh, something that was called Grove's Law, which was basically uh, processor speed doubling every 18 months. That's all gone away now. It's no longer linear. The, the original formulas that they had for advance on the technology have moved largely because of the advancements in software and infrastructure. So now we're dealing with bandwidth at a, giga, at a gigahertz, gigabit layer where at one time, you know, you had a floppy disk that was what, uh, 1.44 megabytes. That was actually fairly decent storage. Hard drive capacities increased over time. Now we're at the point where we no longer, we no longer even stuff our data in our computers anymore. We go to the cloud and we have terabytes of data. We have, we have incredible amounts of data being streamed back and forth between us at an unim- unimaginable speeds. The human biology was never designed to operate at these levels. So we, in effect, are ourselves doing what is called in computers overclocking, where you take the clock speed of a computer and you push it past its, its fixed clock rate. Humans are being overclocked at that level now. Where we're moving so fast. We're getting so much data. We're interacting with so many things that are visual, that are audio, that are sensory perception. Um, these, these constructs of artificial intelligence, these realms that are built inside the Internet, immersive technology, all of this is consuming us, and we do not keep up with it well. We're being accelerated by the digital medium. Randy, I'm taking notes, actually, as you're talking, because it's very interesting to me. Um, You said that this was all designed a long time ago, and I was thinking when you said that, so who designed this? The people who created the technologies? Were they masters of technology, or were they consulting with psychologists and sociologists, how did they know how the human population would respond and then how to keep corralling it and sending it into certain response directions? You know, probably, the, I don't know, the best reference text I have is to go back and read The New Atlantis by Francis Bacon and see what he envisioned in The New Atlantis in terms of the kinds of devices that were being envisioned in, in the Elizabethan era, which was basically television, radio, telephones. All of those things are in the text of that book, in the context of this new Atlantis. Now, why the new Atlantis, and what does that tell us about the old Atlantis? You know, going back to Plato and the vague references that we have in history, and what so-called alternative history tells us about these civilizations that came and went before our own present age. You know, many people think that we are now in the fifth age, that there are probably been previous to us five extinction level events on this, on this planet, this plane, that resulted in civilization basically being um, reset. Um, I have to think, you know, that none of this is new, that all of this has been before, and that we're living in a cycle, in a loop in some way, that we're now real, we're now, we're now at this point again. Um, If you know about the singularity, if you know what um, Ray Kurzweil has discussed in his papers on the singularity, what they're telling us is that in a shorter period of time, as 30 years, the human being is going to be obsolete, that computational speeds and machine intelligence will overtake us, that we will be made um, redundant 
as a result of these machines which we created ourselves. And what they're pushing us towards is collapsing our consciousness into these machines now in quest of something uh, very much akin to biological immortality as a kind of insurance policy against our consciousness disappearing. So, you know, the ancient technology, the technology that's referenced in the New Atlantis, um, what we saw at the beginning of the 20th century with the rise of technocracy, you know, looking at the works of H.G. Wells and, and, and those who were basically writing the script for what became the late 20th, early 21st century, they saw something there. They saw an arc that humanity was going towards, which was more and more towards a technological era in which the machines would become the determiners of, uh, uh, of human consciousness and, and the progression of human history. I mean, I know that sounds insane on one level, but when you begin to look at how this is all played out, there is a plan behind it. And the question is, who formulated the plan and what is the real outcome? Sure. I mean, I'm wondering, and I'm very surprised to hear you saying that in the Elizabethan days, Francis Bacon wrote a book that predicted the television and radio and computers. That I, I would have to see that to understand how and what he was talking about, but that's pretty amazing. So yeah, yeah, we are kind of programmable into our own extinction. I don't know, maybe these people who design this have access to higher levels of information than we do. I mean, kind of on an etheric level, and they know that we're not going to survive forever, and we're going to blend into something else, and then the period will start again, anew. But yeah. I, I just thought I would ask you that because you had referenced someone who designed this and someone who could see through some kind of futuristic periscope um, into how we would be uh, toward all of this, you know, because we are group and herd kind of creatures. We do assemble in groups. We like to be in groups. It makes us feel better. And this is a machine way of giving us a very extended group, right? Yeah, it's group consciousness. Um, yeah, we are comfortable in that. We're social beings. And that's why you have social social media, social networking, like Facebook. I mean, Facebook itself, on one level, is rather simple technology. And on the other level, the science behind it is really the psychology behind it, the creating of what marketing people call affinity groups. In other words, finding what makes you tick and then putting you together with as many other people who share that affinity, share that interest, and then watching what that group develops. I mean, there's a healthy side to that and there's a pathology to it. I mean, group interactions left to their own devices without a moral code, without a spiritual code, generally tend to go very fascist very quickly. And if you look at the political climate, I mean, you, you talked about the election earlier, and it, <clears throat> it's not lost on me. This is an election that's being fought on the, on the digital scale right now. It has infected like some sort of AI virus the consciousness of not just the United States but the planet itself because of the way we are connected to each other. So you have this incredibly toxic atmosphere surrounding these two major party candidates that forces us to make very polarized choices about this so-called election as a means to further divide people and clump them into groups where they are identifiable. And, and, I, and I think, quite frankly, harvestable. I, I think there's a harvesting operation going on psychologically with this. That is very interesting. Very, because as I watched a little bit of a couple of the debates and all I could think was this is not states people talking to each other. This is children in a sandbox fighting and throwing sand at one another and Donald Trump pouting, literally pouting throughout the whole third debate part I watched with his 
um, you know, the opposite of a smiley, up smiley face, a down one. And it just was like a little, he was like a little baby. And this, this is all acting. He's an emoji. This is, you know, look at the emoji thing right now. What's going on with that? Expressions again, avatars of um, artificial intelligence. I mean, that's what this is. You know, we're, we're talking about representational forms of something that's vaguely human as opposed to the actual human itself. We have a, well, it's, it, these are emotional triggers that are being generated for very specific purposes. Very good point, I must say. And I also, I don't even know if I should bring this up, but it did not look to me like they were in real time. And I posted on my blog a video <laughs> explaining how they can actually make two people appear through digital means, like they're in the same room. But I noticed one of the commentators saying after the debate that, oh, in the first debate, Hillary and Donald shook hands. In the second debate, they approached one another, but they didn't shake hands. And in the third debate, they didn't even approach one another, which I thought, I woke up in the middle of the night thinking this and going, wow, they didn't shake hands because they would have missed because they were both digital, right, in the same space. Notice what you just said there. You woke up in the middle of the night thinking about that. That is the impact that all of this is having. The dreamlike state that's generated out of all of this. I mean, in the real world where there's civility and kindness and a discourse that we once called, quote, democracy in this country, we now have two artificial beings interacting with each other via screens, for the most part, via uh, technology. And in the case of Mrs. Clinton, there is even the question of, is that actually human? Is that actually Hillary Clinton? Because, you know, I have to say that as skeptical as I was in the beginning, I've gone through and done uh, some visual forensics that indicates that there's likely at least three other people walking around out there that look like Hillary Clinton representationally in the media. You know, and we've seen the videos on YouTube where it appears as though some of her um, some of her uh, rallies have been staged in front of green screens where f phones that are being uh, in the phones in the hands of people that are actually there, the images drop off of the phones, just as you would have if you were were using uh, a green screen type digital filming. So, I mean, there's all kinds of illusions that are going into this election that that have the semblance of, you know, this this AI type of um, uh, media that that w we're talking about. Randy, yes, and it was actually my friend David, and we have to give him a thumbs up, who identified, the first to identify those uh, green screen effects on the phones. He made the first video about that. So, David, I know oh, you're going to listen to this great. show, and so, yes, kudos to nice you. Nice work, dude. So, uh, what I was saying, actually, to David the other day was that maybe this whole election is an experiment in creating for us, at some point, a, a complete AI figure to lead us. We will just be shown this person digitally who may be a composite or a non-real person and who will have a personality and be able to talk and will think this person is in the White House and will never, the person will never make appearances for whatever reason or, you know, in, in order to believe that somebody is real, you have to be able to see them with your own eyes. But in the case of Hillary Clinton, we've seen people who are 30 years younger, 30 pounds lighter. Well, I shouldn't say 30 years younger, but I meant 30 pounds lighter, a few years younger. And yet they are walked and trotted around as being Hillary. So something is going on, and I believe this is all development toward um, another state of, of uh, pseudo-reality. That's where they're taking us. Yeah, it's kind of like a, it is the image of the beast, the beast computer. Why not? I mean, ultimately, you know, what the, and I've said this a long time ago. Um, what do you really know about these, these, these people that are elected to high office? I've never met Barack Obama. 
Most people never heard of Barack Obama until sometime back in 2002 to 2004 when he began to come onto the national platform. But for the most part to this day, almost nobody knows the man we call Barack Obama. And if we look at him, you know, again, go look at the pictures of Obama from 2004 and look at the image on the screen today. You know, I will grant you that the presidency likely does age people at a rapid level. But there are some remarkable differences in the image of this man who is our, our so-called commander in chief to the point where you go, what is this? You know, what is being represented here? I don't know what we're seeing. This is not real to me. This is an avatar type representation of um, somebody who's so-called leader of the free world. Can you explain the differences a little bit? What you see in 2004? Should I Google images right now? (laughs) You probably could. I, I just see a countenance that's very different. You know, and I obviously the man's aged tremendously in the eight years he's been in office. If you just go back and you would look at his campaign, um, his press pictures from before the time when he was elected and look at, at, at his pictures now, there's some differences there. Are they indicating that he got swapped out or something? I don't know the answer to that. I'm saying that they can represent whatever they want to represent. That on any given day, the images you see on TV are subject to interpretation by everything that is a middle layer between you, the receiver of an image, and whatever is at the back end of the technology that's creating the image. I'm saying that these images are created, the people behind them really don't matter at this point. The political system is is a machine. It's been orchestrated for a very long time. So we don't really actually know. And, and frankly, I don't really even care at this point. I don't, I don't care to explore it. It's like the Hillary Clinton thing. You know, past a certain point when I had satisfied myself that there were anomalies between the different representations of Hillary Clinton, it just becomes something that your brain engages at an unhealthy level. You know, if you're convinced that that's not her or what her is or even what she represents, you deal with that as an abstraction. Is there a real living human being behind the image of Hillary Clinton and what is that image? I don't know and I can never know that. And most people can't know it either. And yet we're going to vote. We're going to make this person the figurehead leader of our national government for the next four to eight years, where policies will be pipelined through them, and we will give all of our power to that person, just as people are doing right now. They're going to vote. They're going to use their hands and their eyes to make a decision about something of which they have no firsthand knowledge at all about the person. I've been looking at Barat pictures while you're talking um and, well, you know, I, have, I would have to spend more time looking and really scrutinizing. But, yeah, he has aged quite rapidly. And I've noticed that, too, that once they get in the White House, their hair seems to turn almost white in a couple of years. Maybe that's why they call it the White House. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, all right, well, that is homework to be done. Looking at Barack, there's actually a Barack Obama's Life in Pictures on a website. But Randy, no, tell us about your shows, okay? Okay, so the, the, the show is called Off Planet Radio. It has a spinoff called Off Planet TV, which is kind of when we do the video side of it. Um, this show began in 2000, late 2009, early 2010. Previous to that, I had done shortwave radio. I had done, from 2003 to 2011, a show called The Threshing Floor, which was, um, that was basically the study of biblical prophecies. And um, I went through uh, a kind kind of spiritual transformation where I no longer could support the things that I believed in the context of 
what was what's called the Holy Bible and, and the Christian um, outlook. <clears throat> and those shows are actually still online because people have asked me, what, what, what the hell happened to you over the years? You kind of changed. And I went, well, no, what changed was when I realized that we had taken something, again, a piece of technology, that was the, the printed word, the Gutenberg press, where the first thing off the press was the Bible. So that was the script that they gave us for the previous age of information. And I realized that that book was horribly mistranslated. It had been redacted. It had been added to that there were, in fact, multiple gods in that pantheon in the Old Testament, that a lot of what we understood about what we believe spiritually was colored by the priestcraft that have run roughshod over humanity in this in this age and, and all the other ages that we've had. So I shifted, I moved, I went into things that interested me, intrigued me, and baffled me, including a lot of my own experiences. Um, I wanted to know more about UFOs. I wanted to know about mind control projects. I wanted to know about the operations of the cabal, the um, dark side of the government, the money system, all of these things kind of became sort of the, the, the matrix through which I, I began doing what became Off Planet Radio. It was originally called Exotica, which was a name that was the show that I did on my previous network. And I just relaunched it as Off Planet Radio in 2011. So it, it there's a lot going on with that show because over the years we've ducked and dodged in and out of a lot of subjects. And I say we, I mean me, me and the people that have kind of taken this journey. Um, I now have a co-host w who works with me on certain shows, Emily Moyer. She produces and co-hosts some of the shows with me and some of the shows I continue to do on my own. And she's also launching off some, some projects of her own. So, I mean, there's a lot there. It's not easily definable. It's basically only dictated by what interests me in a particular time and the people that I want to talk to. Well, Randy, you are very smart, very smart, I must say. And you go very deep and broad as well in terms of your interests and your knowledge and your way of expressing. It's very uh, interesting to talk to you, and that's putting it weekly, but uh, this is a fascinating thing that you've brought up about Barack. Now I'm addicted to it. I'm looking at all these pictures, and you're right. He looks like he's 70 now, and he was only president elected, you know, not that long ago. He shouldn't have aged 30 years in a matter of two terms, right? Well, you know, it's been indicated, and I don't know if you are aware of the work of um, <clears throat> Andrew Bashago who was um, part of a, a, a project in, in the 1970s where um, they were basically using devices to um, space and time jump. And Bashiago has, I interviewed him in 2012. I've talked to him extensively. I've talked to other people uh, who were part of these projects who said that, that Barry Sotero, a.k.a. Barack Obama, was part of this project, that he is in fact a time traveler, and that it was projected that he would be president as the uh, chronographs in the projects themselves had predicted the previous presidencies of the two Bushes and Bill Clinton as well, that all of them were part of a project that basically was formulating the future outcomes based on the technology possessed by the black government at that time. Wow, that hurts my head just to hear it. Yeah, it's painful. So, well, I must say, then let's, um, and I will invite you back to do a more profound show on a single topic where we can be taken on like a, a Randy Morgan's cruise uh, into, into the depths, like 30,000 leagues under the sea. So thank you so much for this. It, it was a wonderful, wonderful exploration of the, uh, the immersive technology uh, phenomenon in our culture. 
and I I have been expanded by what you said, and I'm going to start using that in my discussions with others because you've really pointed out so many things. So thank you, Randy. Excellent. Hey, thanks for um, allowing me to come on and open up my headspace. Uh, you know, I I completely respect anybody that's gone through this interview this far because I think we unpack some things. And, you know, there are going to be people that are going to have problems with some of this. I completely understand that. I have problems with a lot of this. Well, the part about, you know, we are using this technological world to run our lives. I don't think anyone's going to have a problem with that because we can see that. And it's it's on its way to making us into the zombie apocalypse. I'm saying that in a kidding way, but really and truly, uh, people walking around without regard for where they are in real space and time. Uh, maybe somehow, Randy, this is the the door into our own kind of mass time travel you know how do we know let me let me close this out with one thought and this is really where i want to leave this our consciousness is not three-dimensional it's not four-dimensional it's multi-dimensional on scales we don't completely understand if we lock the door behind us and immerse ourselves into the technology that's being given to us, we risk locking our consciousness, hence our, our souls and our spirits, into something that we may not be able to escape from, both collectively and individually. We need to be circumspect about the technology we're using, how we're using it, and we must be very careful to what we give our consent in anything that we immerse ourselves into. Well, I was busy writing again. That was very well said. Very, very well said. And you know what, Randy, if you don't mind, I'm going to start saying exactly that to some of these phone addicted people that cross my path. Don't give your power away. Don't do not give your power away to artificial intelligence. Be very aware of what you are consenting to. Wow, excellent. Now I have goosebumps. So, all right, we'll end the show on my goosebumps and your profundity. Thank you, Sophia. Excellent. Thank you. Hey, everyone. This is Sophia. I want to tell you about iodine, which I've been selling on the website, avatarproducts.com. That's my online store. Iodine is a mineral that the body needs pretty much more than any other mineral. Iodine goes to every single cell in your body. It's crucial for reproductive system organs. It's crucial for the thyroid. The thyroid makes four hormones. It can't even make them without iodine. And what has happened, we've started to make thyroid hormone out of bromine, fluorine, and chlorine because they resemble iodine so closely as molecules. So we're getting brominated thyroid hormone, chlorinated thyroid hormone, fluoridated thyroid hormone. And those hormones regulate so many different systems in the body. No wonder we're falling behind in our cellular detoxing and housekeeping. So if you visit avatarproducts.com, you're going to see three different kinds of iodine. You can get a trial size for only a few dollars, one quarter ounce. And that's a good place to start. So help yourself and feel better. Reminding you, visit avatarproducts.com where you'll find a number of things that I have discovered or I've even designed in some cases that have solved problems for me. Visit avatarproducts.com.